We have a new normal. People are saying uh, we have a new normal. Well, the new normal is normal, and it's volatile. Look at the stock market. Look at the price of gas. Look at your family relationships. I have a daughter living in Sydney, one living in Berkeley, a wife that spends most of her time in Paris, and I live in New York. That's the normal for us. Normal has uh, created a lot of interdependencies between utilities, between various sectors. And those interdependencies cause, during periods of stress, uh, cascading failures. This is particularly clear and evident with Katrina, Sandy, and other extreme weather events where we see power shut down, transportation shut down, communication shut down, water and wastewater to the point where in New York City, where I live, I was drinking water out of a plastic bottle after Sandy. What do we do about that? Well, the term resiliency has come up. And it's been used in a lot of different ways over the last decade. But now it means, how do we recover? How do we repair? How do we adapt? And how do we recover? The section looks at this. And we'll talk more about that later. The resilience section has formed in about the last year. Really got serious about what they were doing last summer and had a uh, conference on climate change and resiliency, and we, that was our coming out party. And one of the things that we decided we had to do is enhance communication, communication between a number of different sectors. Uh, many of us are engineers, but it turns out that you need more than just engineers to solve this problem and be resilient. You need social scientists, which social scientists were the last people I thought would be needed in trying to determine how do we how do we become more resilient? Well, it turns out rebar is not resilient. Concrete's not resilient. People are resilient. And who knows people? The social scientist. So I'm learning a new language, a new lexicon, and learning with new people. How do we make physical infrastructure, social infrastructure, which is, is uh, hospitals, schools, daycare centers, the areas where people get together and they build social capital. And social capital is what we need to make sure that we can recover from extreme events from shocks, from what some people call black swans. They, the goals of our section is first to enhance communications between all these silos of people who used to not speak to one another. The second thing is to identify the research gaps, because this is a new sector, and it's in many ways a new transforming requirement for us to be able to survive extreme events. And finally, to identify the research areas, and that's what Transportation Research Board does, is identifies areas that need to be researched, and there are a lot of areas that we need to research. The section has three committees that are the heart of the section, and they are working with other committees, and we're liaisoning to those committees, to try and determine how do we better communicate in a cross-cutting fashion. Well, one of the things we're going to do is initiate Resiliency Day on Monday of the annual meeting from this point forward. What's that do for us? It allows us to have a day to meet with other people, talk about what this beast of resilience is all about, how do we apply it, and how do we apply it in such a fashion that we use technology in the best manner possible, that we take care of human health as an issue, as the outcome, and then in the last part, we're going to do a new TR News issue to talk about what we've learned and where we want to go. The second part of this is looking at the framework that will be developed over the next three years. So part of our strategic plan says, yes, we want to do these short-term communication pieces, but more importantly, we want to create an umbrella which all the other activities that are incorporated into resilience start to take a place so that we can have more than just at the tactical level, adaptive strategies for fixing the culvert or fixing the flooding problem. We want to be able to put this together in such a way that it fits nicely into community planning. And that includes building codes. And that, again, is where the engineers can come in. But with a rising sea level, you can't have a building code that's going to work for 10 years, much less 50 years. So we have to continually revisit this. 
The last thing we want to do is as we identify data gaps and research needs that we actually do the research need statements that the TRB does which are used by academics, they're used by private companies, and used by researchers in general to determine what are the current topics that need to be investigated. Since resiliency is such a broad uh, area of investigation, of research and of studies, everything from risk analysis all the way to future innovative technologies, how do we make all those things uh, clear to people who are trying to work within the area so they can create the quality of life that we want and a resilient community that we need? One of the things that has to be considered is this whole topic area is emerging. In other words, it's evolving as we have new calamities that we need to address. You never, you never are able to fully, in an uncertain world, a volatile world that's rapidly changing, sometimes going up, sometimes going down, can forecast what you're going to have to do to be able to uh, solve the problem, to be resilient, to recover. What we have to do is be flexible and open-minded in our ability to tackle these problems as they emerge, as this resiliency gives us the ability to uh, recover. The root of the word resilience is from Latin, which says to bounce back. And in engineering, we think of materials bouncing back. In economics, we think of uh, economic systems bouncing back. In terms of ecology, uh, ecosystems bounce back. But one of the things that's different about 21st century resiliency, things are changing so quickly that we have to bounce forward. That is what's needed by anybody that is trying to stay abreast with uh, technology.